Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Tempt not the righteous man to draw his sword. Conviction, righteousness, ruthlessness. To understand tolerance, you have to understand the line of intolerance. War is the teacher, soldiers are the students. They become the bards of war. Well, I'm really happy today to welcome Jim Pugh. He's a life coach and instructor of business-related courses. He also has 35 years of theological study and concepts in ancient scriptures and practical applications into today's world underneath him. He's a wealth of experience in the area of banking, and he's affiliated with some of the groups that are currently involved in this amazing awakening and transition. So, Jim, welcome to the show, and I'll just kind of let you introduce yourself and go from here. Oh, thanks, Scott. Nice for uh, having me on. It was a great conversation this morning, which led to this. But I, uh, in a sh- in a short nutshell, I'm I'm a financial operation consultant, starting out in in 1980, and uh, through that, the consulting practices gave me the opportunity to travel the world, and in doing so, I was able to meet with some of the most intelligent, uh, um, religious spiritual human beings that I've ever met in my life in all kinds of countries. I've lived in 13 countries and spent great adult time in there. And, and through that time, all the way back to the 1980s, when I was trying to satisfy my own anger issues from my childhood, I began to do a lot of theological studying and through the scriptures and and in doing so, I sort of put those together in my travels and was able to to grasp at the time, which I did not know until, I don't know, a couple of years ago, that really why I experienced that was culminating into uh, not only some books that I have written and books that I am writing, but also education that I've been involved with since about 2015. So... Um, it's interesting to see all of this coming together and interesting to meet you and see how all of this works out. Jim, let's start with uh, the most, at least the most recent books that I'm aware of, and that's your God's Governmental Authority Structure. Can you kind of just give us an, an overview of what those are, and then we'll kind of dig into some of our conversation we talked about this morning. Sure. I, I've developed a, a series called God is Government, and uh, basically it's a four-book series the first book deals with the authority structure of God, basically his governmental authority is structure, and it starts with understanding what the, what why God created earth to begin with and what the role of man was, and then walk through the, the hierarchical structure due to the covenants that were originally put in place uh, by God through, the, through Adam that it basically carries forward even today. And in that book, I describe the authority structures beginning with the home, the, the uh, workplace, um, the church, the government. And I bring it all together by, by indicating that basically nothing in this world operates outside of the structure of the home. And it is, it is the home environment, which by, by God put in motion that basically everything permeates from the home. So what has happened since the, since the garden, what we're experiencing now in current times is the battle of good and evil. And in the first book, I tried to identify, I did not try, I identified the fact that basically what Satan had did was drive a wedge in the home, which if he could drive a wedge in the home, home structure, then basically he can control all other structures, which we see as a culmination of what's going on today. The second book is basically titled God's Family Affair, and it's, and it's a, a proof concept of how we are, re, are descendants of God, uh, biologically through our DNA, and it, it talks about our communication structures because we're all energy, we're, we, met, we actually vibrated the same energy level as earth and it it gets into the concept of how we're all connected because god tells us we're connected 
and he says whatever one person does, it affects the other. This brings that those concepts together in such a way that basically we now can understand how how the family and life works within these structures. And the third book, which I'm hoping to complete and publish by Friday, is basically titled A Citizen in a Foreign Land, because if we are God's children, then basically our home is not the earth. Our home is in heaven, and we're living in, in a foreign land called earth. And we have special requirements that God has given us to operate in this foreign land. And if we operate it in, the, in this foreign land under his rules, his laws, and his governance, we would not be in the position that we're at today. And it's the fault of a lot of things. I, I take it back to the pulpit. I take it back to the propaganda machine. I take it back to the government change in our education. But at the fault of this is we, we have failed in various ways to learn really what we as individuals have to do if we're God's children living on this earth. And the fourth book in the series, which it brings it all home, basically is going to be titled uh, The Keys of the Kingdom. And I think this is drastically misunderstood in, in Scripture because I think that basically when God told us that whatever we bind on earth, he binds in heaven, what he's telling us is we have a direct link of governmental control. And in this fourth book, I'm going to bring in the concept of, of the ecclesia, which is basically defined as the legislature of God's government, which if you go back in history, you will find that that's really what it was, is basically the ecclesia back in, in hi biblical history was a center of where the community learned how to operate together and where they brought their their uh, challenges or, or opposition together to be ruled on in what we would probably look at as today's courts. But we've lost that concept. And in, in looking at that, that brings it all back together and closes the loop so that we actually now have a closed in process from the beginning to the end and know exactly how we should have formed a government to begin with. Uh, and, and it falls pretty much in line with your county by county thing that's going on where you're teaching people how, how basically governance works on a more uh, legal structure. What I've, done is in, in my concepts is I put that on a spiritual structure and saying, look, communities, if if you don't do this and you don't provide God as the center, uh, we're going to fail again. As we had in a discussion this morning, you put some pieces together of what was going on in D.C., and I'd like to ask you to kind of explain that structure of what we're witnessing and then how that all ties in here with the God and Governance series. Well, uh, we'll have to go back to I guess the original constitution of 1776 and, and look at look at the development of the constitution from our founding fathers. One of the one of the first things in the constitution it says these are based upon God's principles. And if 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 you don't know what God's principles are, then you really don't understand what the constitution was based off of so that you can put the, the two together and come out with a clear understanding of how all this is supposed to be. So God is basically has its own constitution. And if we can look at, look at that, that's the Ten Commandments. And he has, old, he has laws in the Old Testament and laws in the New Testament. There's actually 1,050 laws in the New Testament. If you take out all of the duplications, you wind up with about 780 laws that basically were the basis of which our founding fathers used to create the Constitution itself. So we have this flow through from a spirituality standpoint into what our governance were supposed to be. And, and one of the things that, that we need to understand in this is in that Constitution, basically, God was not taken out of it. All right. Matter of fact, God was at the center of it. So when we look at the amendments that were put in place about the 
the segregation of church and state, basically what we have learned is that is that's basically having our government out of our religion, religion is pr- religious practices, but it never said that religion shouldn't be out, shouldn't be part of government. That was that's a failed concept because religion has to be in government to hold it accountable because the government is there to support the the conditions by which God set to govern his people, protection um, and all the things that go into God's principles. So understanding that concept and the fact that we can walk through from the original constitution all the way up to today and looking at exactly what our founding fathers put out, you know, the Federalist Papers and all kinds of things, that you, you can see what was intended to happen. Now, there's a lot of things that happen along the way, and, and we can talk about wars or whatever, but let's move right into 1871, which is where we're at today. Basically, there was a, a resonant act that was passed in 1790 that created a new federal district uh, that became the capital of the United States from the original capital of Philadelphia. And the, it, the lands were donated by Maryland and Virginia. The capital territory uh, included uh, settlements that were already in the area. It included the port of Georgia and Maryland, and it included the town of Alexandria and Virginia. And basically, they named the city in honor of President Washington, and they called it Washington. So, in, and that was done in 1791. So after, after that, in 1801, Congress passed an organic act, which basically federalized that territory. So they basically the lands became together in an ownership pool, and they titled it a federal district. And it was located east of the Potomac. Uh, it was, and it was in the new new county of Washington, and basically there's where all of the laws uh, were. The levying a court consisted of of seven uh, justice of the peace. They were appointed by the president, and they be, they acted the laws of the land at that time on Maryland law of 1801. So we were still operating under the original framework of the 1776. Constitution, but what happened in in 1871 was the fact that basically we were a country that was bankrupt, and Congress basically devised a scheme with the bankers uh, who had loaned us the money, and in that scheme they required certain things to happen, and basically. What happened was because the three-legged stool, as I've used in, in several analogies, were in play, you had the Vatican Church who actually ruled the world. You had the city of London at that time who was the money source of the world. And the United States, when they joined this three-legged stool, they became the third leg in 1871. And over time, we've we've been positioned as the police state. So we're the, we're, we're the enforcement arm of what is, what is basically told us to do from the Vatican. Now the Vatican has its own structure too, and we can get in that in a moment, but what happened in 1871 was, is that um, basically our freedom ended. (laughs) And we, we had, we had a, a second constitution that came into play. And that constitution was based upon uh, one of the criteria set by the bankers that we had to accomplish to basically have our debt call at that time to be forgiven. Now, it's never been forgiven because basically what happened was the Vatican Church opened up a corporation in Puerto Rico and um, uh, that corporation became uh, what is now known as Washington, D.C. So basically they took the the district, the federal district that had been 
culminated underneath the um, the 1790 um, Organic Act, and then in in, in 1801 made it a district. They took all of that and they put that into this corporation, and that made then the the governance of this area have be, have a shape of its own government. So, and look at it this way: District of Columbia at that time became a, a city state. It, it had its own laws. It could act its own laws. It could do whatever it wanted to without the approval of the citizenry that was contained underneath the original Constitution of 1776. So de facto, what happened was, is the corporation came into effect. The city of London forgave the debt call at that time, but put us into bankruptcy so that basically we were enslaved all the way from that point until today. And the the Congress at that point in time put that district inside that corporation, making that district then a foreign country, ownership, and then the governing laws that they established underneath the Constitution that they put in place as part of the bylaws of this corporation became the constitution by which they were going to rule that 10 mile square. Now that is all of their rulership that they had at the time. But if we go forward in time and go to Roosevelt days, when they enacted the social security act and they forced Social Security upon all of the citizenry of the original Constitution of 1776, we became a asset of that corporation, and they enslaved us by leveraging our ability of generating revenue to repay the debt to the bankers uh, that were part of this corporation. So the out, outcome of that meant, meant that the United States government basically were controlled by a board of directors. That board of directors was consisted of the bankers and the members of the, the hierarchical order of the Catholic Church, Vatican. And they basically put in motion at that time the ability to do a number of events over over history that we we can talk about but in essence that was the framework so what we see today is is basically washington dc is a foreign country it's owned by a foreign country the people who are who, who work in washington dc are paid by a foreign country think about that all of our tax dollars go directly to the Vatican banking system cartel. They don't go to the U.S. Treasury. U.S. Treasury has to borrow money, so the cycle of debt continues to go. And what ha what the people that are in Washington, D.C. are actually employees of a corporation owned by a foreign entity governing the sovereign soil of the United States of America. So... When we see the activities going on in Washington, D.C. today, we ought to look upon this as border control. Because in essence, the fencing around the area is the area of the District of Columbia. The foreign land, the 10 mile radius area, that was placed into this corporation in 1871. Now, it's interesting when you take that perspective and you look and see the chess moves that, that Trump has made. And, and what we talked about this morning was, had anybody thought that basically the executive order that he issued in 2016 and 2018 and 2020 and all this other stuff dealing with Foreign actors um, interfering with state elections. And we've always thought 
main majority of the population's thought, let's just say that, that basically that was targeted to China, to Iran, to any to, to countries. But what people I think fail to realize is by issuing that, that became the vehicle by which we could actually take back the lands in the United States that were owned by foreign entities, Washington, D.C. And so that executive order, in my opinion, was a direct notice to the actors in Washington, D.C. that says, if you continue down this game of interfering with the change that's required to getting us back to our original constitution, I've put you on notice. And, and by this, if you go through this election and knowing he knew then what they were going to do, and we can talk about that too. He knew then what they were going to do. And he put them on notice and said, if you go down this road, I'm going to affect this EO. And what we see in Washington, D.C., is, is his putting that executive order into effect. So he is bordered. He's, it's a border control around Washington, D.C., waiting upon the justice side of the activity to take effect in that area. This is very interesting. So how do you see the issue then with Joe Biden? In the way you're describing it, what we're witnessing there is, at least in an interim, there potentially could be two presidents. Would that be fair? Yeah. Okay. So let's go. Let's go back in in a period of time. Let's go back and look at the other executive orders and what what would happen along the way to get us to where we're at today. So um, in March of 2020, and I think you have the the exact date. In March of 2020, basically. Trump enacted a national emergency, and, and, and from that national emergency, FEMA took charge over the emergency. Now, let's take that through its, its process steps, and then we'll come back. So when FEMA is enacted, basically they have uh, 10 regions that they set up, and underneath that, those regions, basically they set up uh, a structure an organizational structure that allows them to manage those regions as a governmental entity over those regions. The governors in all of the territory underneath that region basically is responsive to FEMA. And if you look at the FEMA laws, as you've already pointed out on one of your podcasts, is basically they have the ability to to basically become a government, a, gov a, a true government. And they have the ability to eliminate due process. They have the ability to uh, arrest people without due process. They have, the pe they have the right to set up a court system. They have the right to fund things that needed to be funded. They have all of these things things that they can do just like our government can do, but they do not have to have the approval from any governmental authority. Congress, they, Congress doesn't have to prove it. Senate doesn't have to prove it. President has, doesn't have to prove it. Even though the president is in the loop, basically by having FEMA over it, they have, have a, by de facto the main governance criteria over those territories, those six, those 10 regions until the national emergency is lifted. And that national emergency has not been lifted. So the premise is that in, uh, in March of 2020, by the enacting of the national emergency and FEMA oh. taking in charge, the, the governmental authority over the corporation side of things was transferred to FEMA. And they assumed the duties of the government at that time. Now, why do I say this? Well, you take it up to July the 4th. July the 4th, in Trump's speech at Mount Rushmore, he signified that we, the people, had got back our government. 
that was very interesting. Now, not saying exact words that he used, but in essence, that's what he said. And, and right after that, you would find Melania's tweet saying the same thing. That was a signal that said, guys, we've just moved to the Republic. And, and from that point forward, if you look at what's happened and knowing the fact that basically we're fixing to hit the ground running and we don't have to transition from a corporation to a republic, there's be no waiting period. There'll be no major transition period. It is, it's, it's my premise that basically on that day, Trump and the military – became the governing body over the republic. And at that point in time, we had two governments. So right now, what we're faced here is a, I'm going to use the term kabuki theater, because literally the people, and maybe this explains the importance of the Trump base standing up and voting in mass, the people that stand with President Trump, which is 80 million plus at this point, against a government that has only authority by perception and illusion of control. Is that fair enough? Sure. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, uh, and, and basically the people of the United States need to understand that if they, if, if they don't stand with Trump, then they're slaves to a corporate entity. And that's that's the way they're going to be treated. So uh, so people need to awaken to the fact that what Trump and the military did on July 4th was to give the U.S. citizenry the right of sovereignty, what God gave us to begin with and what our founding fathers ensured that we had in the original Constitution. So we have this corporate government that was rolling on at the same time that Donald Trump and the military started in July 4th. And it's it has to be true, because if you look at all the stuff processing there, there's transition documents that have been signed and so forth that will allow this transfer to take place. But it was going to take place under the opposites of the Great Reset had not Trump been there. But all of the activities to bring the organic constitution of 1776 up to a current day working model, all of that activity had, had, had taken place from July 4th until sometime right before the election. All of it had been in, put in place. So all of the transition uh, laws, all bringing that corporation, or that the, the Constitution current, and all of the laws of governance and all the laws of, of financial stuff and, you know, diplomacy and all, all of the things that you need that has happened since 1871 under the treason corporation needed to come over to the republic to allow us to be able to hit the ground with all eight cylinders when this change happened. And that that's what happened from July 4th to right before the election. So the problem that a lot of people have at this point, when we talk about people needing to wake up and we have this sort of dual sense of governance right now, is that those that occupy the District of Columbia as the illegal ruling body essentially control a large percentage of the legal system through lawyers and judges. So what is what, in your opinion, is going to have to happen for this to be cleared up so that the sovereign state of the United States actually truly reclaims its power based on a legal and due process? Okay, so let's go back to the District of Washington, D.C. What is housed on that District of Washington, D.C. is you have the White House, you have the Capitol building, which houses the, the Congress and the Senate, and you have the Supreme Court, all of which are paid and are employees of this corporation run by a board of directors of a foreign power. So in order, and, if, and take it one step further, the federal court system 
is all put in place that are, are basically governed by and paid from the corporation. So the Supreme Court has districts that they, every justice operates over the federal court system in that district. And those federal judges in those district report up through the Supreme Court. But all of the, all of them are employees of this foreign entity. So when you look at our justice system, it is focused on the conditions that are set by this corporate entity as it relates to the outcome of the, of the laws that they're going to rule on, not basically common law that we thought under the original constitution. It was done, it was, it was put in place the fact that basically all of the U.S. citizenry would be would be governed through the courts using maritime law. And basically, in a nutshell, maritime law basically puts, allows a judge to do whatever in the hell they want to do. There is basically no rules that are, are on the bench that could be, con, could be consistent from one judge to another. Why do you ha why do we are not surprised by looking at the election court rulings from one state to another or putting into effect the changes from the legislature of the states by the courts because the courts have jurisdiction to make those decisions underneath the corporation that they are paid and employees for. So when we look at what has to take place, we have to have a cleaning of the House of Washington, D.C., which includes the White House, Congress, Senate, and the Supreme Court, and the federal judges that are located all over the United States. And the only way that we could have law and order in the United States while that activity is going to take place is for FEMA to step in underneath their rules of governance because they have the ability to build court systems and allow them to, to when this starts, they, they would put in their court system to affect the rule of law based upon common law as defined by the original constitution of 1776. Along with that, you have the military side that basically deals with military um, act military issues. And the military by uh, MOJ says that uh, they, can't, they, they try crimes of treason, sedition, and crimes against humanity. So as those court cases come out, of all of this, and it's those types of court cases, they will fall into the military justice system. But if you look at the crimes on pedophilia and sex trafficking and uh, drug money laundering and drugs and all the other stuff that they have in sealed indictments, they have to have a court system that manages this under the rule of law, not the rule of the corporation laws. And I think that is going to come up through the FEMA court system that is going to be established alongside with a military court that allows us to now have a complete blanket over the United States, focus on what Trump has been preaching all the time, rule of law, rule of law. That's fascinating. Jim, I do have another question for you on this, and it's related to this big change, because this is a massive change. And pulling from your wealth of experience on Wall Street and banking, there's a lot of people very deeply concerned about the stability of their money at this point in time, whether they're going to lose things, just they should take their money out. And this is an investment advice, but it's trying to grab a perspective on what you think is going to happen here on that sort of economic front. Well, everybody's talked about 
going back to an asset-backed currency on a worldwide basis. Um, I, I think probably to answer your question with sufficient detail that your audience can understand, we need to look at the United States system. Uh, basically, we have two currencies. We have what's called the U.S. dollar, which is basically a treasury note that basically the citizenry of the United States gets from its bank. And then we have what's called the petrodollar. The petrodollar is, the, is U.S. currency as well. And that currency was used by the central bankers to put forth their agenda on a worldwide basis of control. And they used the petrodollar to settle all trade transactions between all countries. So if you look at it, if, if Mexico bought something from the United States, they paid in Mexican dollars unless they had petrodollars in their treasury. But they paid in Mexican dollars to a to the Bank of International Settlements. The Bank of International Settlements converted those to petrodollars and paid the United States in pet petrodollars and kept the ledger of trade transactions for countries, one country to another. But it was all based upon the petrodollar. So nobody could buy any goods from any other country unless petrodollars. Taking the same example, if Mexico bought something from the UK, they the UK got paid in petrodollars. That was the ability for the bankers to actually levy control on countries because it was the petrodollars that got them goods and services into their countries. So if they wanted to sanction them, or they wanted to, to clamp down on their economic structure or whatever, all they had to do was influence the petrodollar. So when you look at that and you see that basically all of the U.S. sanctions that have happened over time have been directed by the Federal Reserve or the City of London. So when we put a, before Trump, of course, when we put a sanction on a country, we did that at the direction of the bankers approved by the Vatican to put a degree of control on that country because they were, it's like children, they were, they were going astray and they needed to be brought back into the path. And that's what the sanction system was used for. Now, Trump didn't, Trump used that system, but he used it for a different manner. He used it to actually control those countries for the benefit of the United States citizenry. He didn't, he didn't use it for the control and benefit for the bankers. Okay. Uh, if you go back, if you go back to when Trump actually took office, he did a series of trips. The first trip was Saudi Arabia. Then he went to uh, Israel and then he went to the Vatican. And then uh, later on, he went to England. All of those were strategic moves because what he had to do was to get he had to get control over those countries and which he did because what he did was leverage documents of disclosure of the crimes that they had they had done so he says either you get on board now or i'm going to release this now and we're just going to blow this thing up okay so saudi arabia gave him the keys israel gave him the keys he went to the vatican and he presented stacks and stacks and stacks of paper to the Pope. And the Pope, he gave the Pope 24 hours. And the Pope acquiesced and basically gave him the keys. And then he went to London, city of London, Queen. And you, you can see the symbolic nature of this because he's the first man who ever walked in front of the Queen. So you could see the changes occur along the way. But going back to what you asked me, if you... Look at the financial system and understand that basically the control mechanism was the petrodollar and the U.S. dollar was for in-country. Now we can look at every other country. There's 209 countries. 
every country has their own currency except Europe, and they have the euro dollars, and and some even those countries have their own currency like like UK. But what they have is that's an in-country currency. All right, and we as citizenry, if we go abroad, we can take our U.S. currency and trans, you know, get it translated into their currency to use their dollars while we're visiting their land. But on the international basis, where all of the banking is done, it's done through the petrodollars. So what Trump had to do to get control over the central bank system is he had to effectuate control over the petrodollars. And if you look back in time over the last year, in November of 2019, there was a dry up of petrodollars. The money presses had stopped. So basically, he began to squeeze the banking system. And there is a there's a, financial transactions and, and might be another thing you want to get into later, but there's a financial tra- transaction that the bankers do to generate money, which controls the li- liquidity of the banks. And that's called trade for those that are in the financial world. But what he did was, is he shut off all payments that were that were generated from that trade and would not allow the U.S. dollar to be used. So in effect, what he did was he dried up the banking system. Every country out there, if you looked at it on a solvency scale, is bankrupt. So in drying up the currency, he then was able to take control over the central bank. And at some point on the timeline of Trump's presidency, he actually folded the Federal Reserve into the U.S. Treasury. And and that also supports the reason why you had the two government system because if when the US Treasury when the Fed re- put in the Treasury it means that he's put, bringing it into the Republic so that they can get it set up awaiting its new currency there was a lot of activity that had to go on so when we look at assets of individuals we need to know that it, regardless of what country you're in you're going to be issued money that is a one-to-one to what you have. You're not going to lose anything because the value of your in-country dollar, it's, it's valued at $1 today. It's going to be valued at $1 tomorrow when they flip the switch to go to any, whatever the asset-backed currency is going to be called. Where it affects is on the international basis. Basically, the U.S. dollar is not the control dollar anymore. So therefore, every country has to set up an exchange rate one to another. And that's what's taken a lot of the process in getting this new system online is because every bank was sat, was, was settling to the U.S. petrodollar and they had one rate. Now every country has to has to settle between itself and that country. So all there's now 209 rates times 209. Okay, because every country could could settle between each country themselves. So all of that had to be set up and economically evaluated and rates put in place and all that stuff. And that's been going on for some time in testing the system and making sure it worked. Okay, the new system came out, was used internationally on trade. It's been in process for a while. It was not you. It's not been used at the individual level within inside of a country, but the banks in the United States and the world are now all tied to the new system, waiting the new currency to come out. So in, a, in, in your home country, there'll be no devaluation of currency. The valuation of the currency will be based upon the asset value of the country uh, who is issuing that currency to the asset value of the current country that basically the exchange is taking place and that's where you'll see value changes one other thing that happened in the banking system is if you recall when trump came into office he began he immediately began telling corporations to repatriate your dollars from offshore accounts and he gave them tax breaks to do that And the premise of that was he wanted to get all of the U.S. dollars inside the United States 
that were legitimate dollars so that people didn't lose any of their money of devaluation because when the when the switch is flipped any of the US currency that are in bank it's only valued on a one to one basis if you're inside the country and this it also then supported the fact that there would be no currency that flowed into the new system that was generated from fraudulent or illegal activities there's printing presses in in Japan and in Philippines or whatever and the Federal Reserve, the the central bank, when they need to print money, they just turn the presses on and they print in money. No longer can that happen. And so, what is what what's going to happen when the when the new system comes online? Is that all? And I'm speaking now from the U.S. and other countries will have their own rules. All U.S. currency that is outside of the United States of the fiat currency will be almost devalued to zero and anything that is not already in the banking system will not be allowed to be brought into the banking system and it's going to be destroyed. So Trump did two things. One is he said, fraudulent guys that you you have printing presses, you're not going to get new money. Guys that you did illegal stuff that you can't show provenance of how you generated the money legally, you're not going to get any money. Uh, guys, if you don't repatriate your dollars inside the United States, they, he gave them two years to do it. And if you don't do it, you're forewarned. Your value of the fiat currency in those banks outside of the United States are going to be worthless. So what he has done by clamping down on the banks, by controlling the petrodollar, controlling the output of the petrodollar through the banking system on trade, squeezing the the ability to generate money and now controlling the U.S. dollars, he has cleaned the banking system up and prevented the extortion of the U.S. taxpayer because when we go to an asset-backed system, it's truly on the assets and it's our assets. It's our sovereign assets. It's not, and we, we're not going to be responsible to a banker, to a Vatican church or the city of London to provide them our dollars. Any tax dollars that we would then pay after the new system are going to go into our treasury to support the growth and the well-being of the United States citizenry. Does that answer the question? Oh, brilliantly. Thank you. What I would like to do Jim, is to have you back on maybe next week where we can continue this conversation. Your wealth of knowledge and you're filling in so many blanks for people and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. Where can patriots find your work and support what you're doing? Um, I have a website called um, godisgovernment.com and uh, I have I have a blog that I I'm rebuilding history. Uh, on my blogs, and uh, then I have uh, membership forums, and I, my books and and stuff are on that website as well. Outstanding. I'll get those links up so patriots can find you. Would you mind if we close with a prayer? Uh, no, please do. Heavenly Father, we are blessed this night and this day to have Jim with us, to share with us some amazing insights into what is unfolding before us, to really appreciate the magnitude of this change to give us temperance and grace in these moments that seem so stressful and in moments also so dark. We're given the insight, Lord, to truly see where darkness was, there is now light, and we're simply blessed in this time to be here, to witness such an amazing transformation, to completely be freed as a people, to return to our sovereign right, and to return to the gifts that you gave us as your children. And so we are blessed. We We continue to Look to you for strength, humbled by all that is given. And we say these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, Jim, I want to thank you very much for an amazing interview. And I look forward to having continuing this story next week as we look deeper into some of the amazing events that are unfolding. I would love to be back. I want to thank you again. Well, Patriots, that was Jim Pugh. <clears throat> and I do believe you got a bit of an education tonight, as I got one today as well. It was an amazing time talking to him. Jim will be back next week. Uh, you notice we've pinned 
the location of his uh, website. You can go there and check out some of his material. And he's also doing a radio series that I'm actually sharing with in our discussions of his one of his series of books on sovereign.